Welcome to this edition of Theological Journals, and we are with the historiographer, a message from the president of the NEHA, Jean Ballard Terapurka, National Episcopal Historians and Archivists. At long last, we've scheduled a NEHA membership meeting. We will gather October 16 and 17 in the late afternoon. While we hope this will be our last Zoom meeting, we are nonetheless grateful for the technology that makes this possible. On 16 August, we will have two sessions. First, a crowdsourced collection of member updated research reports, and second, a special presentation by a long NEHE members, the Reverend Dr. Christopher Agnew and Mr. Richard Mamana, on the long, rich relationship between the Episcopal Church and the Russian Orthodox Church, a topic on which Agnew and Mammon Mamana are experts. On August 17, day two, the two sessions will include first our general membership business meeting, and second, our keynote speech by NEH member, the Reverend Dr. Brian Wilbert, archivist of the Episcopal Diocese of Ohio, who will update us on the recent site move and practical management of the archives of the Episcopal Church. And I hope, hopefully, we'll be able to attend that. Between now and August 16, watch NEHA's Facebook page. Notifications on the available clearinghouse in your email box for further details of our 2022 NEHA membership meeting. Coming together this summer, we will renew the bonds of personal and professional collegiality that enrich and enliven our work. How lovely that would be, and what a good preview for our in-person Tri-History Conference in 2023. NEH member online meeting, August 16 and 17. Sign-in instructions will be available in July. Nominations. The term of all NEHA officers and board members expired at the end of 2021. Elections for all explored bo expired board seats will be held during the business session of the online annual meeting. Okay, we will be on our lookout for that. Episcopal historians. Now, as we think about salt, oh, I'm sorry, in the June edition of Table Talk, which has been talking about anger here and there. We have an article here by Dr. Barry York, pastor of professor pastoral theology at Reformed Presbyterian Theological Synod Seminary in Pittsburgh. Shepherding Friends is the title. <coughs> In certain quarters, men heading toward the ministry are told that they cannot have friends in the church. Why? They are to maintain the dignity of the pastoral office and fulfill the calling to shepherd the people, not to be their friends. Let us reject that concept completely. Why? Because our Lord called his own disciples his friends. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. If you do what I command you, I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. If the Lord of glory befriended men this way, then certainly the church should be a place for true friendship. Developing friendships in a congregation will lead to more loving, effective shepherding. Elders can encourage friendships in two simple yet profound ways. Build friendships among the elders. 
efforts at friendship should begin among the leadership of the church. Beyond the regular time elders meet to attend to the needs of the church, they should have unique fellowship with one another. Elders can host one another for meals in their homes or meet for lunch. A pastor can visit elders at their jobs to learn what they do. Elders can arrange and look forward to special events with one another and their families. An annual retreat with elders to reflect on the ministry and make plans can aid ministry. And it can be greatly enhanced with significant time devoted to sharing lives and praying for one another. Friendship among elders builds teamwork and fruitfulness. And cure, courage community among the flock. The Cambridge Declaration decries how the church typically operates today. Therapeutic technique, marketing strategies. The beat of the entertainment world have often more to say about what the church wants, how it functions, what it offers, than it has to say about the word of God. Because the church has lost its trust in the power and direction that God's word gives, it relies instead on a frenzy of programs, activities, and specialized ministries to be significant in the community. Yet the Lord's desire is for the church to be significant as a community. The New Testament pictures the church this way. Believers were breaking bread with one another in homes, Acts 2.46. Elders practiced hospitality in the church, 1 Timothy 3.2, and visited the flock to care for them. <clears throat> church membership personally bore burdens and met the needs of those in the church and around them. In other words, they showed deep pastoral Christian friendship to one another so that we are told that when Peter and John were released by the council, they went to their friends who were praying for them. May we work so that Christian greeting rings true in the church. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends, each by name. 3 John 15. And we're taking a detour on the holiness of God in Isaiah 6 as an exposition on Exodus 19 and Sinai. Isaiah 6, 6 to 13. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. Popular understandings of the Lord in our day frequently refer to him as one who meets us where we are or who loves us unconditionally. These views are so common, in fact, that even many Christians speak of our Creator in these ways. Yet we should ask whether these understandings about the Lord are accurate. Read in their best light, the answer is yes, they are correct a point. If all that is meant by these views is that God does not wait until we clean ourselves up morally before he shows us his grace, or that we can do nothing to merit the saving love of our ma maker, then we can agree. After all, scripture is quite clear that everyone except Jesus is fallen in Adam and dead in sin. Consequently, we cannot make the first move toward the Lord, and we are wholly unable to merit his favor. If God were to require us to be worthy of salvation before he saved us, no one would ever be saved. Furthermore, even after we are redeemed, we remain sinners who need God's gracious forgiveness and can never earn heaven. If, however, these mean, views mean that God demands absolutely nothing from us and that one can be in a state of salvation without turning from one's sins, then we disagree. God's call to Isaiah helps to understand this. Isaiah, when confronted by the Holy Lord, cried out in woe. 
because he recognized his unholiness before God. In today's passage, we see that the Lord did not dispute Isaiah's exclamation. Instead, he sent an angel to cleanse Isaiah's lips with fire. The Lord did not merely accept Isaiah as he was in his unholiness, but acted to purify the prophet. We are not just to sit back and do nothing when confronted with the truth about our sin. Rather, like Isaiah, we are to confess our sin and trust in the Lord's mercy. Having been absolved of sin, Isaiah then was sent by the Lord to preach to the people of Judah, verses 8 through 13. <clears throat> the holy God shows his profound mercy in forgiving his people. But he adds to this grace by also commissioning them for service. Our lack of holiness before God is real. But if we trust in him through Christ, he delights to use us as instruments to advance his kingdom. Let us confess our unholiness, but let us not think that we cannot be used of the Lord despite our imperfections if we trust in him. And then a detour now to Leviticus 10, 1 to 3. We're talking about holiness in this detour from the experience at Sinai. Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. Before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. In our last study, we spoke of the reality that many people view. The Lord is demanding nothing from his creatures. That unconditional love for sinners means that he overlooks transgression. Sometimes it can be hard to believe that people who have read the Bible actually hold this position. By the time one finishes reading the first three chapters of Scripture, it's evident that God does not take sin lightful, lightly, Genesis 3. The Old Testament in particular bears strong witness to the holy wrath of God, recording many occasions when God intervened in history to bring judgment against transgression. 2 Kings 17, for example. But some have said that was the Old Testament, and in the New Testament, the Lord is no longer a God of wrath. Some people in history have gone even so far as to argue that the God of the New Testament is so much more loving than the Lord of the Old Testament, and that these two testaments are not describing the same God. The early church heretic Marcion, middle of the second century, Rome, held to such a view, and it has been the unspoken assumption of many people since his day. Even if one does not go so far as to say that the Old and New Testament speak of two different beings, many people find it hard to understand how God could show both love and wrath. Yet if our Creator is perfectly righteous, Psalm 711, then wrath is a necessary consequence of his encounter with sin. It is even a necessary consequence of his love. For the perfectly righteous God must love righteousness and love holiness. If God is who he says he is, he must punish unrepentant sinners. Today's passage illustrates this truth. Two of Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, attempted to perform their priestly duties in an unauthorized manner. We're not sure what that is. Were they drunk? Where it's not clear in Leviticus 10. As a result, the Lord struck them dead. Leviticus 10, 1 and 2. Aaron likely realized the justice of this action 
and he kept silent, as we read in 10.3, when those two of his sons were killed. We can multiply other examples of the holy gods bringing justice to bear against the impenitent, as we're doing in the story on Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19. Ultimately, there's no mystery in the Lord's punishing sinners. Rather, what is inconceivable, apart from divine revelation, is that the most holy creator tolerates transgressors at all. His long-suffering mercy is what is hard to understand, <clears throat> given his promise to Adam that he would kill sinners. But even in showing mercy, the Lord does not merely set sin aside. Instead, he shows mercy to believers because he has demanded and satisfied justice through Christ. We'll pick that up next time. We'll be looking at Luther's view of holiness. Now we are in the July issue. And we are reading an article maintaining our distinctness as the salt of the earth and the light of the world by Tom Ashgall, a Southern Baptist pastor. The Apostle Paul emphasizes this aspect of the Christian calling when he calls believers as living in a cro crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, Philippians 2.15. The heart of this responsibility is our duty to live as faithful children of God who accurately commend his saving grace in Christ and reflect his character in the world. As he who called you is holy, so also you be holy in your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16 reflecting Jesus's teaching, good afternoon, Mary, but also reflecting, as First Peter does, Old Testament texts. We're looking at that. We'll be looking at that a little later today. The Old Testament and St. Peter. In fact, all the scriptures cited above are in the plural. The call to holiness belongs not just to the individual, but to local congregations. When a church fails to fulfill this calling, it undermines the good news of salvation that proclaims, and then it dishonors Christ's name. The church in Corinth learned this the hard way when they allowed scandalous sin to go uncorrected in the membership. Its spiritual apathy about the Lord's reputation brought the apostles' rebuke in 1 Corinthians 5 with the incestuous situation of a mother and her son. But it's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans for that a man has his father's wife and you are arrogant, ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. The Corinthian believers undoubtedly thought they were being loving and non-judgmental in the presence of this scandalous sin in their midst. They were proud of their tolerance when they should have been grieved the outbreak of sin among them. In the rest of the chapter, Paul corrects their faulty thinking about sin, tolerance, and holiness. When a church tolerates unrepentant sin within its membership, such as the Episcopal Church, it demonstrates a lack of love for the one who is sinning, for the unconverted, and for God. A church in the context in which individual Christians are taught, strengthened, and encouraged to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ 
brothers and sisters who know and help us overcome inevitable idiosyncrasies that attend every believer as well as resist the regular temptations that plague us all. They help us to live in faith and repentance. When this kind of mutual care and encouragement is commonplace in a church, the power of the gospel is put on display to unbelievers. The truth of our message is given credibility by the character of our lives, thus providing a powerful apologetic for the gospel, being the salt and the light as individuals and as churches. Finally, and most importantly, when church members love each other enough to hold one another accountable, they demonstrate that they love God and his glory more than their love, more than they love their own ease or reputations. Such supreme love to God's will, to God will compel a church to obey the apostolic command to deliver unrepentant members over to Satan, 1 Corinthians 5.5. 5. By loving God supremely, by loving God supremely and loving people sincerely, a church will maintain its distinctiveness from the world, and it will properly be positioned to carry out the mission that the Lord has given us. As a holy people, we can humbly call sinners to join us, and being reconciled to God. Only by being separate from the world can a church live effectively in the world as salt and light. And our second article is by Warren Peel, who's pastor of Trinity Reformed Presbyterian Church in Newton Abbey, Northern England. Northern Ireland, he would be a covenanter, as I would understand it, in Scott's tradition. The light of Christian separation. According to a 2015 article in MIT Technology Review, a single candle flame can be seen with the naked eye in the darkness from a distance of 1.7 miles. And that was why my father, a Royal Canadian sailor in World War II, tells the story that sailors were not allowed to smoke cigarettes outside at night at sea because the cigarette butt and light could be seen at a significant distance. Dad did not smoke, but... That was the rule for sailors in His Majesty's Canadian Navy. Even the smallest light stands out because it is so different from the darkness all around it. It must be different if it is to be seen. If it is just like the surrounding environment, it will make no impact on an observer. In the same way as the light of the world, Matthew 5.14, Christians must be distinctive in the world. We're called to be holy, set apart, separated from the world. But what should that separation look like? What form does it take? Should we retreat into Amish-like communities, shunning anything that is worldly? And I have some, um, not Amish, but Mennonites who live in the area, and they go to Walmart. I always stop and talk with them. They are some of the most delightful people in the world, and I'm not a Mennonite. A Christian, just as loving as possible can be. So I'm not going to become a Mennonite, but I surely love them. The Christian church has a long tradition of this kind of separation. Hermits, monasteries, dating back to the earliest days. For example, in 429 AD, a Syrian Christian named Simeon found a 50-foot high column that was standing among the ancient ruins, built a small platform on the top, 
and lived there for the remaining 37 years of his life, spending his days in prayer, reading, and meditation. He was known as Simon Stylites, literally, the pillar man, and inspired a succession of followers who took the columns to separate themselves from the world. Simon Simeon has his spiritual descendants to, today among believers who believe that they should have as little contact with the non-Christian world as possible, shunning all secular television, music, film, and literature. Some believers even avoid friendships with unbelievers altogether. After all, referring to unbelievers, doesn't Paul say in 2 Corinthians 6, 17, go out from their midst and be separate from them. Is this what it looks like to be a light in the world? No. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians makes it clear that a wholesale withdrawal from everything in the world that is not Christian, is not what separation from the world means. 1 Corinthians 5, 9, and 10, the same section on the incestuous family. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of the world, or of the greedy and the swindlers or idolaters, since then, you would need to go out of the world. It seems that some in Corinth may have taken these words to mean that they had to withdraw from any kind of interaction with non-Christians. This became a particular problem when they were invited to the local pagan temple for dinner. In the ancient world, temple complexes had small dining rooms where hosts could invite friends for a meal. Corinth had at least 13 temples like this. The meat on the menu would be from the sacrifices offered to the god or goddesses of the temple, and prayers would be offered to that deity in the course of the meal. It was one thing to go to an unbeliever's home and eat meat, Bought in the marketplace that may have been sacrificed to an idol. Paul doesn't forbid that. But eating in an idol's temple is participating with unbelievers in an act of pagan worship, something that Paul describes as being unequally yoked with unbelievers. Imagine two animals being yoked together to pull a plow. One is massive, powerful ox, and the other is a domestic cat. That's the picture Paul is using. And his point is that there is no such utterly different creatures could ever work closely together in any kind of harmony. It would be the height of folly to try to make them. An ox and a cat may be able to live together on the same farm, each benefiting in different ways from the contribution the other makes to the running of the farm, they cannot be yoke fellows. They need to be separated. Christians need to understand that there are situations in which they must separate from non-Christians to avoid being unequally yoked. Paul hammers this point home with five pairs of completely contradictory and incompatible realities, righteousness and lawlessness, light and darkness, Christ and Belial, believers and unbelievers, and the temple of God and the temple of idols. Believers and unbelievers belong to two such utterly different realms that they cannot be yoked together, nor do they pull in different directions, but they pull in completely opposite directions. This principle has many relevant and challenging applications today. It applies to any kind of multi-faith worship services. How could a Christian and a Muslim pull together in worship? They would be pulling in opposite directions. 
It applies to membership in a church that has abandoned the gospel and fallen into heresy. It certainly applies to marriage, for there is no closer relationship between two human beings than the one flesh union of husband and wife who are to be yoked together for life. It surely applies by extension to the dating or courting relationship before marriage, in which a man and woman are yoked together in a serious relationship as they explore the possibility of marriage. It is often hard for Christians to have non-Christians as close friends, given the fundamental and radical differences they, that are between them. Business partnerships with non-Christians can be difficult because values and priorities are different. A separation may involve painful loss and sacrifice, especially when friends are involved. We may be derided, self-righteous, narrow-minded bigots, but we will shine like lights in the darkness bringing glory to God and bearing witness to the world around us. More, there is wonderful encouragement to endure. For God himself promises to let those who let their light shine in this way, who are mocked and insulted for the sake of holiness, who are misunderstood and left friendless, quote, I will welcome you and I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Surely this more than compensates for any loss uh, or pain. And we'll bring this edition of Theological Journals to pass, to end. Good to see you, Mary. And we'll pick up in a couple of subsequent sessions later this afternoon. If the Lord be for us, who can be against us? Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Godspeed.